Welcome everybody. Uh, this is uh, my name is Adrian Amandi. I'm with the California School for the Blind Education Resource Center. Uh, I'm really excited about today's Tuesday Tea. Uh, it's a topic that we know our students are engaged and excited about. We know a good chunk of our students talk about music on a daily basis, and they want to they want to utilize music in their education and and have music be a tangible outcome and product for them. Um, and I know we don't always make that happen in the way that we could and that our field can can learn more about music and um, and make gains in this in this area of uh, education for our students. So we've brought in um, we've brought in some ringers today uh, in the music world. Um, rather, uh, we have two two sets of places of people who get a focus on music for kids with visual impairments uh, every day, all the time. Um, David and Gail Pinto run the Academy of Music for the Blind in Southern California um, and have a rich history of a multiple, multiple musical endeavors in their past. And Charles Lloyd is the music teacher at the California School for the Blind. Um, really appreciative of all of you for being here today. We also have a student at the Academy of Music for the Blind, Dorothy Cho, today. Um, is with us to bring some student insight should questions come up and you guys want a perspective from a student and Dorothy, uh, feel free to do unmute when these guys are talking and share your insight and ideas. Um, this is meant as a discussion. Uh, so I'm hoping that we can get kind of an overview of music uh, for kids with visual impairments and blindness um, and uh, from either Charles or Dave, if one of you could kick us off with that um, kind of an overarching theme here. So, um, yeah, um, Gail and I have an Academy of Music for the Blind uh, that we, we've been going quite a long while. Uh, I've been teaching the blind since 1996, and we've had our um, Academy of Music since 2001, who is incorporated as a nonprofit in 2003. We've seen so many children, had so much experience with their challenges in school, and the joys that they have in uh, making music. Um, and I certainly will ask uh, a few questions of Dorothy, but because uh, she's one of the students, uh, she's not, not now with uh, the Academy. She's 16 years old and a thriving musician and student, loves, loves tech also. You know, one of the things I, I, I'm not gonna exactly, um, I don't have anything prepared Formally, but I, I wanted to mention just one thing, how important socialization is for the children uh, with uh, uh, their sighted peers, um, as well, of course, with their, their blind peers, but they're in a school, they're generally the only blind kid there, you know, or maybe there's another one. And so uh, forming social uh, connections is not always easy. Uh, uh, well, it's, it's challenging, but with music, I mean, uh, if it's not music, where do we get our social cues? Well, usually visual, right? So there's a huge disadvantage there, but in music, it's auditory cues, and there's where the blind are excelling, and so they can have an, you know, the, the, it's a level playing field, isn't it? So the, the children can really, the students really can bond through music. And of course, if they're tech savvy, which a lot of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, a lot of the blind kids are because they have to be in order to uh, have access to all the wonders of this century here. And uh, they can bond through tech also, but those are those are two primary ways that they can socially expand. Um, may I ask Dorothy to comment on that? Do you find that music is a great way to bond socially with sighted peers? Yeah, I think I think it's a, a wonderful way because um, music doesn't um, doesn't only like it, it speaks in ways that you really can't express in words. So through music, I feel like it, it's um, it's one of the best ideas to um, socialize with people because 
it's it just speaks in ways that you can't express. You also have friends through uh, because of your interest in tech also, is that true? Yes, I do. And um, with uh, technology, it's it's a lot easier to communicate with with people. Um, I love that. I love that you brought the socialization and the social component up as one of the first things too, because I feel like for students, especially in the middle school and then especially in the high school years, you know, the experience of the student is about finding their place and their people within a school. You know, you have, you know, even if you're, uh, even if you're a social person, you can be friends with a lot of people. I feel like a big part of the experience in a high school, if you guys and probably relate to this is students need to, you, know, you need to find their, their, their people. Um, when that can be for some students, it's in sports, for some it's in drama, for some it's in tech, for some it's in these different things. And music provides one of those um, outlets for students. Um, and especially for uh, a visually impaired student who maybe is, is, is now not, uh, is not able to participate in the sports program and the sports might be a dominant culture at the school. Um, music can can be a play is can be one place for for some students. So it gives that an option there. Yeah, it's it's a wonderful thing. What we've experienced through the years is all of a sudden one of our students tells us maybe they're in the fifth or sixth, seventh grade. I'm in chorus now, and all of a sudden they get more and more friends and. Um, and then they're in the, the school talent show and maybe they won a prize. It just opens up the doors. Um, and uh, so anyway, yeah, that, the so, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. So I think it should be encouraged. Uh, so we encourage them to get into music and then bang, they hit some walls. And I think that's what we're here to talk about too. Some of the, some of the uh, the challenges, right, Adrian? Yeah, I was gonna say, or even before, like you said, when they get into music, I think sometimes as a blind student or as the parents of a blind student or even a teacher, um, a music teacher or a TVI, I think sometimes that wall comes up before we even enroll the kid. Um, and we're worried about the accessibility of the music program. We're worried about whether our student will be able to learn from the music teacher. Uh, there's a lot of at least challenges in our mind uh, that come up as teachers, and we're hoping that you guys can shed some light and clarity on are those real challenges? And if they're real, do you have some uh, advice for us as teachers to overcome them and as parents and students? And and or are they are these myths uh, that ought to be busted? And do our students uh, are our students more able to fit into a music class than some of us might think? Yeah. Well, let's talk about uh, let's let's uh, how much talk about outside of school, getting music experience outside of school, and then let's see how that can be supported or even introduced newly in the school. But outside of school, uh, parents notice, oh, wow, my kid is really interested in music. They're, they're really doing it. They're playing, uh, fooling around with the keys on the electric piano, or uh, they love to sing. They never stop singing. And so then they look around for some sort of teacher. Um, that's problematic um, because uh, most teachers are afraid um, of teaching uh, a blind person. And they needn't be if they're creative. Uh, one of the uh, things that stops them, Adrian, as you know, is that idea that braille music is necessary in order to do it. And then so, so the teacher immediately says, oh, I, I just, no, I get, I, I'm not going there. But the fact is that uh, Braille music is no more necessary than it is to read before you talk. So Braille music is necessary um, as the kid uh, is, begins to get into choruses, uh, sophisticated choruses and bands and orchestras uh, where it's necessary no longer just to use your ears to hear the part, 
but there's some inner parts. You're the third clarinet in the symphony. You can't distinguish it at that point. You got a choice in the in 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 the public schools. Uh, either you have like somebody uh, who is willing to a teacher who's willing to record your individual part and put it on an MP3 or an M4A, whatever the format uh, you're going to be playing back on your devices every time you get music. That that's that's asking too much of the teacher. Um, so at that point. Uh, and we'll go into detail. Um, uh, Charles and I can go into detail on that later about what the the teacher can do to support, but it's too much to ask at that point. So Braille music is very good at that point. It's wonderful. But for the first, uh, you know, from the ages of four to 12 or 13, Braille music is wonderful as a, um, the, the way Latin or learning another language is going to be uh, useful. It, it establishes, you understand the parts of speech, you, it helps you, you know, but uh, it's not necessary. So uh, it, you, they don't have to be afraid of it. They don't That's have to so be. motivating. Um, and I know as a TVI myself, I know, and I, I've counted, talked to countless TVIs who get that kid who enters the music program and they get this moment of fear. And they're like, no one taught me Braille music. That was not part of the program. I don't know where to go. Where's the resource? And to hear, wow, this is not a necessary starting point means that we as teachers, we, we never want to be the roadblock to opportunity, um, but we often are. Um, and sometimes it's a simple hesitation of a fear of Braille music that causes us to not extra encourage our student down that pathway to music. So Hearing mm -hmm. loud and clear, that is not a, a roadblock for us as teachers. And we encourage music participation um, at any age, any level. Definitely. Well said, well said, Charles. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I think I think maybe the the theme of the myth the MythBuster theme of the of this might be that Braille music is not the default, uh, but it is a part of of any student's you know musical literacy. You know, um, I think there are uh, many sighted musicians uh, uh, coil up in fear at the sight of sheet music in front of them. Students spend num many years learning how to read. Students spend many years learning how to become good Braille readers. Um, learning to read Braille music then takes a lot of time and a lot of practice. Um, and uh, it can't just be solved with, even if they're a good braille reader, solved with giving them braille music because it's another code, it's another language that they are needing to learn about. Um, so that truly is, I think, like the maybe the the theme is it's, that's not the default and it won't solve the 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 problems. But one thing that I think David and I did talk about, and one thing that it will solve a lot of the problems is. Uh, students fluency with using their technology is extremely helpful um the phone can do so much if they have an android or a iphone and learning to use the voice memo feature a very a very common straightforward feature that that nearly every device has or if they're using an ipad or a chromebook it has a voice recorder in there learning to use that independently and learning to use that independently and learning how to organize their music library will could be a massive tool for the visually impaired student um, in learning the music of their class um, especially you know middle school into high school years um, that and it's so it's so simple but so effective um, i personally use the voice memo feature for any rehearsal I'm in, any lessons I take myself and with students, um, it's like the note taker for a musician, sighted or not. Um, yes. It's yes. the ultimate note taker for a musician is to be able to easily make recordings to reference so they can go back and practice them. Yes, Dorothy, um, we're talking about, as you know, um, uh, starting to get up, talk about devices. And so this is on the, the student side, and we'll be talking about 
responsibilities of the teachers and the TBIs, but just on the student side, can you give us a little bit of insight on uh, what devices do you use to make uh, uh, music, uh, your music classes uh, accessible to you in school? Well, usually for me, um, so uh, when I was younger, I used to use a digital recorder, like a separate um, digital recorder that you can just kind of buy. Um, but now I use my iPhone and voice memos. Um, like everyone else was saying, it's an incredibly helpful tool and it's really good for learning because um, now like, I mean, before there was the, uh, there wasn't the feature to re rewind and fast forward like 15 seconds at a time. And I really like that feature now because it helps, um, it helps me like listen to something over and over again to perfect it. Um, so voice memos not only improved from, um, and it was already really good, but it's also um, the, since the recordings are, are higher quality too, that I can hear the notes clearly and I can, hear um, everything that the teacher is saying. And um, I think overall, it's, it's just been a, a, the most helpful tool for me personally. Your, your, um, your phone and using a uh, voice memo. Yeah. There's, there's, a, there's a app that you can play back your voice memos through that I just downloaded. Uh, one of our uh, blind teachers, Tony Del Castillo, uh, uses it. It's called Audio Scrub Remix. Have you heard of that? No, I personally use a uh, voice stream reader, actually. Um, uh, th this, the reason why uh, Tony uses it, it does all the things that voice memo does, but it also can speed up or slow down. Yeah, that's the same feature with uh, my, uh, my, a choice as well, voice stream reader. You can speed it up, slow it down, uh, rewind, fast forward in different increments. So that's why I, I use it often to play it back. Good. Right. What is the name of that? Oh, um, it's called Voice Stream Reader. Voice Screen Reader. Voice Dream Reader. Voice you Dream Reader. Record in there? No, um, but you can save your voice memos onto it. So. You can go into share and then was it more and then you could actually have it um, copy onto voice stream and it'll play back the audio from there. You could also bookmark, uh, bookmark certain spots and speed it up and slow it down. So it's really useful. Talking about being facile with technology, that is an impressive use of, of the tool. So the app enables you to bring in your recording which then allows you to speed up or slow down or rewind, fast forward. Nice, Dorothy. And then, uh, so on the, on, the, on the student side, so he has a device where you can do that. Now for the very young, they may not yet have phones in school. So I think we can make that a separate conversation, but for the kids that are 10 and older, usually they, they're given an iPhone. Um, or another, you know, an Android, but the iPhone seems to be the, the default. Is, is that everybody's experience? I would say except that the iPhone is, is significantly more expensive than, than other phones. And as far as using a voice memo feature, they're, they're ubiquitous and they're in all, all, all forms of the phone. So it, it maybe doesn't necessarily matter if they're using I didn't even think about that, the whole cost thing. Yeah, they are very expensive. So do your students uh, have Android phones too? They do at CSB. Okay, yeah, I don't, I think every one of our students has you know, I, a One thing I had a thought too um, is like we've said, look, there's many different types of students. So we, thinking about the young student, I was just thinking about, you know, the student in fifth, or fourth, fifth, sixth grade who may just want beginning to join band or orchestra or choir at their school. Um, in which case, usually at that level, all the students are beginners. Um, and in most traditional programs, they are, are sight or reading oriented, sight, mu uh, sight reading or music 
sheet music oriented. Um, and I think, I think at that stage, I do believe that the, the visually impaired student um, can absolutely participate in band class. Um, and it, they should be approached with, with using both a, a recording device that's at students. And if they're too young for a phone, they still make digital recorders. They're fairly inexpensive, maybe $40 at the most. And teaching the students to use um, the digital recorder. Um, and also then finding a coach to teach them Braille music. Because if they're going to begin a path of being an orchestral or a player or a jazz player or in a, in a, uh, a choir in, in using uh, traditional notation, they should begin learning how to read Braille music um, at the fourth or fifth grade level if it is to be their path. Um, and they fully can participate in band class if they have that recorder because they may be learn. it may take them a lot longer to read Braille music, but they can certainly learn to play their instrument by ear and with instruction about fingering and then also be learning Braille music with that as part of their whole um, learning. And I think there's many sighted students that also benefit just by learning by ear and with learning fingerings because the sheet music component, it throws many students off. They start reading and all of a sudden they, the, the, they're overwhelmed. Students that, that maybe even have the slightest bit, bit of dyslexia or other types of, of, um, of uh, challenges like those, reading music um, can be very hard and confusing and it's almost a barrier to experiencing music themselves. So, um, but, uh, so th thinking about the fourth, fifth, sixth grade student, just in the beginning of band or orchestra or choir, I think the, the combination of learning to use a recorder and learning how to record notes like that, you know, and organize their library, as well as finding a, a, a tutor, someone that can teach them braille music and begin that journey of like music literacy is, is important. Um, I believe okay. before that level, sorry, I'll just say this is the last thing. I think bef I believe before that level for general music, um, all students there, I there should be no reason why any student cannot fully participate in in their general music class until that until that point of where it's a general music for all students. Um, and I spoke with a, a teacher at Fremont Unified, and I asked her how she would approach it, and she said she makes all her activities inclusive for all students. There's always at least an adaptation. Um, and I was joking with one of my my uh, teachers like when I. I taught in a classroom of 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 all sighted students. Oftentimes, what I left on the blackboard, if I wrote on the blackboard, it may not be erased for months because we rarely used it. Even um, so much of what we did was about singing, listening, rhythm on a drum, uh, the fundamentals of music that have nothing to do with reading on a page. Um, so all students should be able to participate. Yeah, I agree. And I think uh, you made a point also that, that it can interfere with the music experience in one way it can, aside from the reliance on it. Well, actually, because of the reliance on it, you stop, stop using your ears. And so kids can pick up things. Uh, there was a whole, whole way of teaching called the Suzuki method that was based on the fact that Mr. Suzuki realized, wait, you know, we talk before we read. so. What's all this about we have to read music before we play? So you stop, it's just natural human nature. If you, it's like when you, if you're gonna give a speech say, and you know exactly what you're gonna say, but you got your notes and then you start reading your notes and now you forget what you're gonna say, you're reliant on your notes because that part of the brain that knows, doesn't know unless I read it. So. It, it's an art to, to use, uh, to make reading, uh, put it in the proper perspective. Now, to be practical, I think we should talk about what the music teacher and what the TBI can contribute and what we can expect from them. So maybe we should steer the conversation now to the nitty gritty. 
I was thinking the same thing because I'm hearing you. I'm hearing you that a student can learn auditorily, right? But we know music teachers, like so many gen ed teachers, are told use visuals, use visuals, use visuals. And I'm assuming some music teachers have bought into that and are using visuals. And from the TVI's perspective, when you run into a teacher who is, are they? Can we ignore them? Can we discuss what they are and not make them accommodate for them? Or what is the nitty gritty? What what can we tell a music teacher to make their class more accessible? And what can a TVI do to either discuss with that music teacher or work with their student to make it more accessible? Well, uh, it, uh, let's talk about being in a band or a chorus. Uh, so if you're in a band, then the, uh, the director has the responsibility to get the music in a format that the child can use. So uh, the two things are, as we have discussed, it's an, uh, they need to get an auditory file. They have to get a file um, in electronic format that the child that the ch and the child has the device to be able to play that back. And it can be the iPhone, it can be the iPad, it can be their Android, it can be uh, their computer, whether it's a PC or it's a Mac. Um, now, or it could be a Victor stream reader. Um, all these different possibilities, but they have to, it's the responsibility of the music teacher to get that to the kid. And uh, the second responsibility is to get Braille music. Uh, uh, so they, they'll have to have hire a transcriber, um, uh, contract a, trans a music transcriber to provide uh, the Braille music in BRF format, uh, which is readable by the kid's note, note taker, or if, they, if there is no electronic note taker, then it has to be embossed. Hi, sorry to jump in. My name is Annalisa. I'm a teacher in the East Bay, Northern California. Um, my undergrad, ironically enough, is music, and I am teaching Braille music to a student. Um, I'm pulling her out of class. I've just done it myself, just vastly researching trying to figure out because sheet music does not correspond to braille music. And then having to read it with, I, we refer to it as dot numbers only. I won't let her say D, E, F, whatever, or G. Um, I'll say, okay, five, one, four, five, where's that middle C? And she's playing bells. I brailled the entire set of bells for her and we're learning that way because I, don't, I couldn't find another way of doing it. And I have this beautiful little music wheel that's brailled to help her with that, to help her mom see it as well. Um, but it's playing by ear is not really conducive with playing bells because you have to move hands and try to find out where that B flat is. So my question would be, sorry, I'm just kind of like, just it's just been really stressful because I wanna make sure she has equal access. So I pull her out and give her private music lessons with what they're learning in class. <laughs> um, so my question was, how would you notate on a sheet of music braille like for instance, I can say, okay, we're starting at middle C. If she's starting for a Jaca, for instance, a B flat below middle C, I can tell her one, two, six, um, what is it, two, three, two, four, five, and that's B flat to start. But would I, would I notate that with octave markings or just for the Cs, like five, one, four, five, or four, six, one, four, five? Do I just denote the octave markers on C only? You're, at, you're asking a technical Braille music question. It's a great yes. Question. Sorry, I'm not, a, I'm not a Braille music uh, teacher. Oh. Oh, we okay. do have. We do well, have, dang it! <laughs> yeah. But we do have one, and can, may I put him in contact with you? I would absolutely love it. Yes, I will put my um, address in the chat. My uh, yes, that would be amazing. So thank you very Good. much. <laughs> I, I transcribe it by hand for her. Did you get your education in music trans uh, Braille music transcription? No, sir. <laughs> I'm How a TVI O and M. I How on the fly teaching myself, teaching oh, okay. myself uh, right ahead of her. Um, so that's what I was asking too, I, because I have a lot of questions for your music transcriber. <laughs> but I, my undergrad's in music, ironically enough. So, but she doesn't have equal access. Like when they have they, they play Kahoot, for instance. I do have a friend who's a transcriber in Alaska that has this graphic basically music organizer so I can teach her what a staff is. So I can show you her what the what print would look like. 
so she could play a game with her, you know, like with her classmates. But since we're still distanced, I can't do it physically with her. But I want her to make sure that she can say, okay, what is this in the third space? Okay, well, let's see. It's A or C or whatever, you know what I mean? So I want her to have equal access to that so she can play with her classmates. That's but, fun. I, what I don't understand is why do you pull her out of music class rather than allow her to stay in music class? So you can listen to both, but I'm pulling her for for an instruction to actually learn her bells, to, to learn the exercises that the teacher wants her to learn by the end of the school year. So that means complex rhythm and that, not complex rhythm, it's like trying to teach her rhythm. It's difficult via Zoom because I have to say as I play because Zoom won't pick up the pitches that are played on bells. So it's just not, I just pull her. It's easier for me to teach her directly. Um, she's teach, She now knows four songs, which we, what they do, learn in school I try to pull out and say okay we'll do it and I'll I'm going to transpose it to C because she's familiar with that octave and so I transpose everything on the fly so just because I want her to have equal access because she deserves it good for you um I appreciate that that question too and it and I think what your question also reveals is how highly technical um it becomes uh you know this idea of, of how we transcribe stuff to Braille music and then the student needing to learn how to read Braille music. It's, it requires also um, a coach that's highly trained, um, like you are uh, a TVI and you have a music degree, um, which is a lot of, which is a very large skill set. And still there are um, these challenges, which reveals just how much, um, how layered it is and how complex it is um and you know adding to the fact that when a, a sighted musician reads they can play and read at the same time which a, a musician that is reading braille music is basically impossible to do um, in which case they are then reading to memorize a part and then execute a part Actually, which, yes, you know, which is how many musicians also um, operate, even in the classical world, many musicians eventually memorize the music that they're playing. Um, but within an orchestra or a choir or a bell choir, um, as uh, reading, sight reading is a part of the experience, as well as following a conductor, um, which are... Um, which do present some considerable challenges. Um, um, my question for you too would be how effective is also that student playing by ear, especially being able to perform with the conductor? Um, how, what, in your experience, how effective has it been and has it been possible? In so it's been um, tricky because she's not in, we're not in school. You know everything is virtual so i haven't been able to do that but i those, those things have crossed my mind as far as having a strong musician sit next to her and tap out rhythm or tap out a, a measure before she comes in for instance um because i think that's important because i've had other students in playing in different with low vision this particular student has no vision so it's been a really big challenge and she decided to play band i'm like sure let's make it work and it's tvi it's sink or swim. You got to make it work, right? Or figure out a way to make it accessible for your student. So the way she plays is that she doesn't necessarily play in, um, let's see, not, we try to keep her on tempo, but I want her to find the notes. So what she's literally doing is playing one-handed, trailing with her left hand, finding the notes, striking, playing, and then trying to figure out where she's going. But she knows where these notes are. In fact, she may even have perfect pitch. She can delineate between E flat and E, and we're building scales and that kind of thing. So um, she's come a long way. She's no longer married to having to, to dampen the bell she's striking, the bar she's striking on the bells, um, she can let it ring. So that's what I encourage her, let it ring and find out where she is. And I have her say the note names as she's playing. Rhythm, we're trying to get to that. We, I started with claves with her, playing claves and counting out rhythms so she can hear that, counting it out with her. Um, Subdivision is still a struggle because she's still trailing with her left hand trying to find the next note. So we're just practicing more and more. She has, like I said, four pieces that she can play 
And she really just like, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> this so, is, yeah. No, I was just going to say, this has been fun to listen to and over my head in the world of music. But the fact that I know that our field is so full of individualization and eventually that kid comes along in that one class and to make access possible, it gets really hard. Um, and Annalisa, cheers to you for for wading through that and figuring it out. Um, I do want to go back to the less intimidating side of music. Because <laughs> um, at the Sorry end of that, I'm like, oh my God, what would I do? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, call Dave and Charles. Um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> what what can we do as TVIs for, for that regular music class? Like what, how can we get access to it without all of the stress on the, on the, on the braille and on the uh, pulling out 99.9% .9 of us can't pull out our kid and teach music. Um, and so we want to make sure that relationship between the teacher and the student is strong. What can we do there? Yeah, well, if we have a group class, we've talked about it. Um, uh, the responsibility for the for group like chorus or orchestra band, whatever, the responsibility uh, of the uh, teacher and music teachers to get the music beforehand. Beforehand, it has to be got in both formats. If the child reads braille music, then they, they need to have the braille, but uh, always they have to have a audio recording. I, I like the idea of what um, uh, Annalisa was saying is you, you, it's always good to partner with a peer to have them next to you. So for instance, entrances in group things, uh, counting rests, uh, you know, to give the child a cue when it's their turn to come in until they can do it independently. So having a friend there, and uh, I, I do know that we have uh, children in school who have that arrangement. They're in a band and they have a partner there that's helping them. And uh, it's not a thing where the, uh, the blind child feels, oh, I need a crutch, because eventually they get independent. Not only that, eventually the sighted kid may learn something from the blind kid, because the blind kids usually have a, a great music IQ. So there's a wonderful bond there between the sighted and, uh, and the blind kid that, that, that should be part, I think, of the music teacher's um, you know, thought process. How can I support? Well, let's let's get these two kids together, supply the materials, and uh, um, then on the kids' side, they have their recorders, and they're very proactive about it. Charles uh, Charles has really stressed that how important it is that a kid is proactive about using their device to to put the rehearsals or the important parts of the rehearsals. Uh, on the device. So what about um, what about the TVI, uh, Adrian, you were saying? Um, what special role is there? Not the music teacher, but the TVI. Well, um, Annalise is actually providing the Braille music instruction. So maybe it's time to talk about what are other things the TVI can do to assist do you have any ideas on that, Charles? Um, sure. Um, I think that um, you know the the uh, the first thing a TBI can assist with. I think the two primary things, and and we're talking about not band or choir, but maybe general music or if it's yeah. singing. Um, yeah. If there are materials um, about the music, whether it's lyrics and these types of things that aren't notation oriented. But materials about the music, of course, just like any class, getting in them in Braille for the student that they can read and access. I think I, I apologize that it may be fairly obvious, but I'm just stating it. And um, and then the second thing is, you know, when we talk about the recordings and resources, it's easier said than done. I think a student needs to learn how to do that. So it comes with really learning to use their technology, how to organize their library of uh, voice memos. Um, organization is huge because if they have a whole collection of voice memos that are an hour long, it's not it's not helpful. So they need general coaching around how to take notes, 
like they would in any class. If you just record the whole class, then you got to sit through the whole class to find the information you want. Learn how to um, be a good note taker in general. It's a student skill. Um, something I struggled with for many years myself. It's a general student skill, being a good student. Okay, this is something I should record. Boom. Now I have my note. It's 30 seconds long, and that's the thing that I need to study and practice. Um, and on top of that, then, um, you know, YouTube or where they listen to music is also important to develop a relationship with. I think, you know, unfortunately, I think that we think of YouTube as like, this is where, this is TV where, where kids go to like watch, be entertained. And that's true, but it is an incredible resource for a music student. YouTube is an amazing resource for the music student, not just to listen to the music they have, but actually there is tutorials on how to play a lot of stuff um, on YouTube. Yes. Um, and the classic situation, myself, I'm a guitarist is my primary instrument. And many times in band, the band teacher was a trumpet player and they knew nothing about the guitar. And they would say, here's the trombone part, figure something out. And because the guitar is, is traditionally, it's quite hard to notate for in the case of fingerings and this kind of thing. It's also why a lot of guitar players are not readers themselves. Um, and so the band teacher may not know how to teach the guitar. Well, there can be many tutorials there are many tutorials. Most popular songs have some kind of tutorial that someone has made um, about how to play something. Yes. And if a student can learn, they both have to learn that that's available to them and how to find the good sources because there's also a lot of bad videos with misinformation. Um, so, but a student can learn how to navigate that part as well. But I think the TVI, the role as their coach, as their teacher, is to teach them, how do I teach myself? How do I learn? How do that's I empower a, that's myself? That's a great point. How that's do I empower point. myself to learn? Um, exactly. I think that's exactly. where the TDI can, can, can share a role. I think the, the other component too, if in the general music class, so for the kindergarten through fourth grade or fifth grade, for example, if their music class is heavily visually oriented. I think it's something that also should be discussed um, around why is that? Because aside from a student with visual impairments, not every student is a visual learner in general. So if a music classroom is, in, is heavy on using visual things, whether it's color coded stuff or these types of things for their music, they may want to think about diversifying how they're teaching this the subject in general um and uh and that's a that's a larger point and the last thing i'll say is this i really appreciate uh annalisa's question and i want to encourage people to please ask questions so we could specify maybe to serve their needs of like answer their questions if we can so please don't be shy to put them in Thanks. I wanted to ask, uh, first of all, totally think that idea of learning how to learn, learning how to use your devices, really great thing that the TVI can help with. As far as uh, YouTube, great resource. Dorothy has her own channel. Dorothy, can you speak to your use as a student of uh, YouTube? Yeah. Um, for me, uh, YouTube has helped me uh, learn new songs. Um, of course, um, if um, I use both my uh, the music service that I'm subscribed to and YouTube, and usually I can look things up on YouTube. I could listen to, I mean, a lot of songs. I can search it up, and it'll. I can listen to the instrumental, and then I can listen to just the vocals um, based off if uh, any YouTubers uh, uploaded that. So if I really needed to, and I don't know what to sing somewhere, I just listen to the vocals and the harmonies and, and I can figure it out that way. And that's a very, that's a major use of, um, it's a major advantage to uh, YouTube compared to just using like your music services. And some people have uh, lyric videos um, where they actually, post the lyrics in the description. So 
um, sometimes I can follow along, read the lyrics in the description, and then slowly get to memorizing songs. And so that's another advantage um, of YouTube that, that I have. Um, I also uh, wanted just to mention something. Thank you, Dorothy, that one of the challenges, whether it, uh, one of the challenges is that kid where they are in the nation wants to get music lessons private, say, or wants to find a music transcriber. Uh, there's no central resource for that. And uh, so uh, the Academy of Music for the Blind, our, our organization's teaming up with the American, well, the Children's Eyes Foundation, and we're uh, creating a website. It will be up in about two months. And it's basically a uh, repository of all the information we know about who, are, who teaches the blind music where, and uh, where are the transcribers. And so you can, uh, so all these professionals can, can uh, it's a central registry for that. And it's going to be maintained and it'll be a great resource and also it will have a lot of materials that we at the Academy are putting together of Dave, you cut, Dave, you cut out and are muted. Just, oh, you're still muted. Uh-oh, Zoom hiccup. What if I ask to unmute? Does that cause you to pop up something on your screen? Unmute. There you go. Uh, we caught okay. you just that you're putting together a group of resources. Yeah. So it's a central registry of uh, uh, teachers, uh, music teachers of the blind and transcribers, and also information on uh, uh, educational materials on how to teach the blind if you're a music teacher. But that's one of the main problems is that children uh, don't have any, don't know where to go. Adults, the, the families don't know where to go. So that's something that's in the works and will be available. But uh, just wanted to mention that. That's a, a great need and it's going to be met. Um, I see a question about MuseScore in the chat. Um, and MuseScore for everyone is a, is a notation software. Um, it's actually a free notation software. Um, so my comments, I guess, about MuseScore, any notation software would be this. Um, uh, learning any notation software, there's a learning curve to it in general. Um, if anyone's ever tried to do, it takes time to learn how to use a music notation program. But if a band teacher, and this is now where, where a TVI can come into uh, service, if a band teacher is providing charts, um, and maybe Annalisa can, can share this too in the case of, of the um, bell, of a, a bell choir as well, or, of a, or a choir. If they are using sheet music charts, if they've created them themselves in Finale or Sibelius or some kind of notation software, or if they have purchased the chart, which many, pro, many school music programs are either purchasing their music, um, which they have to oftentimes to perform them, or they're creating the charts themselves, they um these programs will will play the music on the computer and they'll play it with a click track and they can customize it to say play the third clarinet part only with the click and they can make a record they can uh make a mp3 of just that um for the student inquire band if they receive the recording of the tenor part for for band that's just played off of the off of the notation whether it's muse score and they hear the click they can learn that part how it goes which is how all the students need to learn it actually and for some students when we talk about reading rhythms they get totally flustered reading rhythms and a teacher needs to make everyone sing it to learn how to play that rhythm um, because reading it, it looks crazy. <laughs> and reading it right. in real music, it looks even crazier. <laughs> right. So they have to learn how to sing it to play it. Um, there you go. <laughs> so, the, na the, name, the name of it is MuseScore. There was a question. It's called M-U-S-E-S-C-O-R-E. -S -S -E, and it's accessible. Uh, it's best done with NVDA. 
although JAWS will do fine with it. Um, it's best done on a PC platform or uh, it's not as good on a Mac. But MuseScore is a very good learning device, not just uh, to make, to learn, uh, in other words, uh, we teach it in order to teach note values. Because, and so the student can enter in a series of quarter notes very easily, a series of eighth notes, series of it's eighth note triplets, et cetera, et cetera, all the technical details of what music is. And they basically write it and it's easier than Braille. So it's a, actually a wonderful learning device. You can't count on your band teacher having a score uh, and being able to abstract the parts. That would be wonderful. And right now, I think the more practical thing is rather than that they can abstract that part from the, uh, from the entire score and have a, 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 a music file of it. Uh, we want that, but that's not always going to happen. Right, Charles? And this is oh, Annalisa. Yeah. Get, okay. Sorry. Go ahead, Annalisa. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's Annalisa again. Um, we, so this particular school uses smart music for the sighted students, so it will play your part with an accompaniment piece so you can hear yourself within the band. But my, specifically, I, I'm referring to it as bells, but my student's playing mallet percussion. So that's what, that's what I've transcribed. So that's why I'm trying to, you know, build and say, okay, this is B flat and all that. Anyway, it's, it's complicated, but we're getting there. <laughs> but it's played within, I'm, teaching her the ones that the, the band teacher thinks is important to really take as a takeaways for the year of band by the like eight or 10 exercises that we're working on. Um, there was a question about a Zoom cutting out. Uh, it, 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 there's a compressor by default on Zoom that's not good for music. So you wanna use original sound, that's it. So you, there's, a, there's a, a setting, it's an advanced setting. And if you wanna know how to do it, you can contact us, we'll give you a tutorial on it that I've written out that will show you how to use Zoom with a music class. Cause, oh, I don't have to press this anymore. I'm unmuted, okay. So in other words, I always have the child in the beginning clap four times. If you can hear all four claps, fine. But usually it's like this. That's, that's what happened. And that's because they're not using the original microphone sound. They're using the sound with a compressor, which is fine, but not for music. So there's a solution to the person who asked about Zoom is not good for music. It's great. You just have to uh, have the right setting. This is a load more fun than I thought it was going to be. I thought you guys were going to be telling us how to, and we're going to all leave with like this or that. And I'm like, oh my goodness, and this other, and that other. Uh, what a field. Give us another hour and we'll have all the answers <laughs> supplied for you guys. <laughs> I think we're, I think it would take more than an hour. Um, you guys are so rich with, with knowledge and experience. You know, I can't not ask. So when I started teaching as a TVI, you wanted a high school kid who was ready to write score. You called Dave Pinto and you asked about Sibelius speaking. Um, is there, I know, Dave, you're not still writing Sibelius speaking. That's no longer a thing for music notation, no, is it? No, that Sibelius speaking was a program that I wrote that went on top of Sibelius, a very big program that made Sibelius uh, accessible and I got to teach Ray Charles it for a year and a half and that was wonderful. And he was writing scores for his band at that point. That was just great. Before he was just dictating one quarter note, C, third sax, eighth note, you know, like that through the whole whole score. Very frustrating, was very excited about it. Uh, but I stopped supporting Sibelius because uh, um, some, somebody started doing it for free a young guy started doing for free and I was old at that point and I don't do free things when I'm old. I don't do expensive things, but I need to make a little money anyway. So I stopped that and then he got tired of it and stopped it. But MuseScore came along. Okay. So MuseScore is the same thing as Sibelia. It's not as powerful as what we had, but it's free and it's wonderful. Same thing with GarageBand. It's free and it's very good. Before we were using sonar and cakewalk and I had made that accessible. And that's what many guys are still using in their professional multi-track studios. They're able to create, you know, 
you can do it now with free stuff. Logic, Pro Tools on the Mac. And uh, so a lot of stuff is so accessible now. It's very exciting. And uh, Dorothy, what do you use to multi-track? GarageBand? Yeah, I use, I use GarageBand in order to do multi-track um, action for, for music. On your phone? Yeah, um, on my iPhone. Too cool. Uh, Incredible. Incredible. I know that uh, um, at uh, uh, Berkeley College of Music is, is has a fully uh, adapted um, recording uh, recording program. They've developed a program called Flow Tools, which is for the blind or visually impaired user to um, use uh, Pro Tools. Um, there's a shortcut system that they'll learn. Um, I will say about any of these recording, multi-track and recording programs, um, aside maybe from GarageBand, but even with GarageBand included, there is a learning curve, and it's uh, it it takes time to learn how to use these programs, um, and it's important to know that going into it that um, that it takes it takes time, and you have to ch chisel away at learning how to use these programs. No, it's not true. Not true. It's really fast. We have six-year-olds doing it. Well, that's that that yes, that part is true. But pushing record is one thing. But then when you're like, okay, now I want to edit it. Now I want to loop it. You're right. They learn six year and six-year-olds learn very fast. Um, yeah. But but um, in my experience, also with with some of our students at CSB who are very good music students. They also find using these programs to be pretty frustrating because they want to do something and they can't figure out how to. Um, so you know it varies on the user um, for okay. for these things. But um, so Adrian, uh, do you want to lead the conversation to the final uh, uh, stretch? I feel like I want to go learn how to play music. <laughs> 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 might, might as well There's an app for that. that. Yeah, I can, I can get on YouTube, I suppose. Um, this is exciting. Yeah, I think um, I've learned a lot. I think one of the things I'm going to do is I'll send out an email to both of all three of you guys and uh, Eric Nielsen, uh, blind educator, whoever you are, if you want to contact me on the chat and send me your email as well. I'd like to put out a resource guide in this description of YouTube and kind of make these all these products we're talking about a little bit more robust to people who attended because I think it's uh, I think we need to kind of grasp them together and put them under headings and um, make it more clear to people. So I'd like to take this knowledge and make something for people. Um, but yeah, I think I think uh, we've learned so much. We know that music is accessible to blind and low vision kids. We know that as a TVI, there's different avenues. We can convince a music teacher that that, it, that we can learn by ear, that we can learn by partnering, that we can make the socialization so important and weave in what a student needs in their character and becoming and finding themselves. Music can play a huge part in that. And um, it's something that us as educators should, should push when a student is interested. We should make sure that they know we're gonna make it accessible. And we should be behind the scenes with a teacher or right at the front of the scenes with uh, translation or recording or teaching how to use a recorder to make all of that happen. Um, what 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 are the next steps then? So a student's excited and they like, what are the further opportunities? I know California School for the Blind is, is a wonderful resource if you come to our school. Um, we don't necessarily have an academy or a program outside of our school. Um, and Academy of Music for the Blind historically has been available if you live in the general uh, area and you can drive there on Saturday, is, is that a possibility for extra resources? Are there other resources um, that kids can follow up with or teachers can follow up with? Well, the Academy now is a hybrid program. So it's teaching children from all over the United States. Uh, and it's a big Saturday, long Saturday program. It's a comprehensive, very deep uh, education in music. And, uh, and then the other thing is there will be that central resource that we're developing with the Children's Eyes Foundation, uh, where you'll be able to find resources for uh, all around 
all around. Um, so we're available at the Academy for a consultation. If you need, need uh, some advice on any particular thing, if we can uh, provide it, we can provide it uh, uh, to you. Uh, it, it, if it's not huge amount of time, it's be totally free. We want to be able to help you. And like with the Anna, Lisa, make sure that we get in touch so that we can uh, get our Braille music teachers to talk to you about the issues that you have. Uh, my contact information, your contact information, all that, is that available or do I have to provide it? Uh, I connected you and Annalisa specifically. If you want to share your contact info with everybody, I can do that for you. Or yeah, would, yeah, uh, will you do that? Yeah, Great. your email or your uh, the the web page. Uh, let's let's start out with my email, which is you know d like David Pinto at ouramb.org. O u r a m b dot org, and um, and then the website is www our amb.org and we're on instagram and facebook and all that um i have my email in the chat my csb email um if you want, if you guys would like me to dictate it here i can it's it's simply c lloyd at csb dash cde dot ca dot gov <laughs> that's the standard email address but um, you can always read, you can also find me through the school website and I encourage um, anyone to reach out if you have ever have questions serving um, your students and you have questions about um, how to how to do any of these things or or get pointed in the right direction. I'm always happy to um, be of support if I can. So I uh, please feel free to reach out to everyone. Can, can we end it on getting a word from Charles and Dave and Gail and Dorothy on if if a blind student comes up to you and somebody on your caseload and they're interested in music, whether they say it outright or otherwise, right? Like you're reading in between the lines and you know this kid might want music. Um, our kids haven't learned their voice yet and they they might be passive in this question, but they, they express to you as their teacher or as their parent. Um, that they're interested in music somehow. What what do you say to them? What is what is how do you respond to encourage that um, and open that door in future to them as wide as possible? What you want to be a musician? No, <laughs> you got to be a dentist. <laughs> well, no, that wouldn't work, would it? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, what did you do, Gail, when your daughter, who is now a successful audio engineer using flow tools and pro tools and um what did you do when she expressed interest at the age of two years old <laughs> that was kind of a no-brainer when she started playing the piano and couldn't even reach the keys and uh was playing the theme from cheers because she'd heard it so much from our television <laughs> she just started playing it so if we had a clue she was good at music yeah <laughs> But um, yeah, I've had other, I'm also a TBI, retired, and um, I've had students who have gone the music route. And uh, I think it's just an, you know, an important thing where the kids know, the parents know, and they just wanna know how to make it, progress it on. So yeah, I, I don't think you have to, I don't think kids with music in them have trouble expressing that. And just I don't feel think- the yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I don't think most parents of blind children are really happy to know they have an interest. You know, that that's so dynamic and so strong. And um, but what did you do in order to give her an education? At what point did you start finding resources? Well, let's see. She she met a blind pianist who greatly encouraged us to give her braille music. So we tracked down a Braille music teacher and we were in Illinois at the time. And she just progressed with the Braille music through her. Um, I can't remember if she had it in school, but she learned everything by ear because she has a you know, perfect pitch. Um, she went on to Braille, uh, to Berkeley College of Music in Boston, as Charles was talking about. 
and um, she was in the marching band in high school. So that was another whole gig. Um, yeah. We were so lucky to have a director that was open to the idea because he had never had a visually impaired kid. And he was like, yeah, we can do this. I'm like, cool. So uh, yeah, we figured that one out. And she was in orchestra, jazz band, marching band in high school. And then she went on you know, to the university. So yeah, she's done it all. <laughs> You did, so you got a Braille music teacher. Did you get her a teacher of an instrument? Piano. Is that Piano? She, yeah. Piano. And then How she also early? played flute as well. How early was, was I she? I think she was nine years old when she started Braille music. Mm -hmm. And and did she learn, uh, get a teacher of a musical instrument before nine? Uh, just piano. What, what but age? that was all by hearing. Um, I would say five. Five? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, never too early. Four years old is a great, great age to start. We have four-year-olds in our academy. They're incredible. And then, the, you know, it's, it's a wonderful thing. So that's what we would say, Adrian, is just most parents are really excited to hear the, about their interests. And so they're looking for resources. That's what we get a lot. Where, where do we find somebody? And, and, the, and what I usually say, if I can't uh, serve the child, I say, go to a local college, look up the Music Teachers Association. The, because if the, kid, uh, if the kids in the college who are in, in the music, they generally can think on their feet a little bit better than an established music teacher. So they're willing to, to try new things. What are you laughing about? <laughs> you know, established music teacher, substitute any kind of teacher. Yeah. <laughs> we no, get stuck exactly. in our ways. <laughs> yes, we do. We do. And then we learn the amazing things. Yeah. I, oh. I think the key word that you said there with your, um, about your experience with marching band too, is a teacher that's open to this. And I mean, that's a huge thing. And that's where the experiences vary is, is the teacher themselves in, uh, open to thinking about different ways um, to to reach that student. Um, if the teacher is not open, then um, then that's that's it's sort of at an impasse for that student. I think that I think it needs to work both ways. The teacher and the teacher needs to ask themselves: Am I open to figuring out a way to support this student being able to participate and experience this? Um, and, and perhaps that's also where the role of a TVI in a, in communication with a music teacher can help them get ideas. That teacher might just need to get the wheels turning to think outside the box. And then they suddenly will have an epiphany. Oh, I bet I could do it this way. And that can come from a conversation that you can have and you can share with the TVI. Hey, we've done this in other classes. We've done, I've done this for my student in this class or this for my student in that class. Um, what do you think? What can we do like in band? Like, what are the obstacles? And, um, and you might be able to help that music teacher problem solve, um, yeah. which I think could be really helpful. So, uh, That's awesome. Dor Dorothy, is there anything you want to add to, to a teacher or to a student or a parent for how they could encourage their, another student to seek music and advance in music? Um, yeah, so for me, I think I would just tell them um, it's great that you're interested in music. And as you as you continue studying music, you know, if you don't like it, you know, you don't have to. But if you, you're going to, I mean, I almost guarantee you that you're going to start to like it more and more and more um, as you continue to, um, as you continue to, um, should I say, chase uh, down the career of music and life and it's just going to get more and more fun and you're going to improve a lot and technology is also improving so it's you know it's going to be easier and easier to uh, to kind of find the path to uh, being a musician that's awesome I really, I can't say enough how much I appreciate all of you guys joining us today I know when people think of 
blind people in music, you know, they think of Ray Charles and Andrea Bocelli and all these guys. And for me, there's this Mount Rushmore of blind music and Dave Pinto is certainly on it. Uh, Bill McCann, Wayne Siligo, uh, our old music teacher at the California School for the Blind, who Charles is taking the reins from in our program and is just running away with it. Um, and I think this ability for us to inspire a new generation of uh, blind musicians and low vision musicians is just awesome and rad. And I really appreciate all that you guys are doing. Thank you. Thank you. What a great host you are, Adrian. Nice to speak with everybody. Yeah, thank you everyone for tuning in and uh, I really appreciate it myself. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dorothy. Yeah, rock on, Dorothy. Thank you for joining us.